Welcome to another episode of the Dibbly Dobblers Cricket Podcast. As always, I am your main host, Callum, and as always, I am joined by secondary host, DJ, producer, DJ, director, I don't know, whatever, I was just going to add something different and okay. spice it up a little bit. Spice up your life. All right, that's... Uh, can we restart this? <laughs> no, no this we're, we're rolling with that. <laughs> Rolling in the deep on that one, anyway. Oh, wow. And it's <laughs> Andrew. How's it going? Yeah, it's all right. How are you? Uh, well, I'm, I've been better. Been ill this week. Not that I'm going on about it or anything. But no, no. Is that the exertions from Saturday? Just not <sighs> chair? Can't. Oh, it was easy on Saturday. Are we just it? still spewing after your... Well, you know, I am, decision. actually. <laughs> I'm, I'm still fuming. In fact, that's maybe what it was. The enragement <laughs> of a shocking LBW decision. <laughs> It was filthy, Andrew. It was absolutely filthy. You did not bad with the ball, though. Ah, four for six off my nine was pretty decent. But it's really sloppy last over when you conceded three runs. I can't. Poor. Poor. To be fair, the foothold, I mean, that just wasn't <laughs> good. I'm surprised I still have two working ankles. I'm not going <laughs> to lie. But yeah, uh, the five for still eludes me. So you got yourself a couple of wickets? I did. Yeah. Um, it's all right. I was, yeah, a couple of catches it was a spectacular catch off you your bowling I think. there was a spectacular catch it was palmed up by short extra cover and caught by the man behind him diving at full length it was it was a, quite a sight to see um yeah there was a spectacular one off your bowling That's as well excellent slaps, slap that? catch so. by a youngster by a youngster <laughs> <laughs> or not maybe but uh, yeah. yeah so our, our club's fortunes have turned themselves around, it appears. Yeah, a couple of defeats to start. We've had a couple of wins since. I'm not playing this weekend, unfortunately. So a third one in a row, it shall be. Excellent. <laughs> anyway, let's have a chat about what's coming up on this episode, because it's quite an exciting one, actually. I feel like we needed a voiceover man for that. You know, yeah. We'll need to work on that level of production. Yeah, absolutely. I'm on tonight's that. episode! <laughs> <laughs> because we've got Two interviews this week. Two, two interviews. interviews. And two, actually, pretty big ones as well. Big, I would say the two biggest we've had so far. Absolutely, like yeah. So later on, um, you will see an interview that I did earlier in the week with ESPN Crick Info's USA correspondent, <laughs> Peter dropping. Della Pena. Um, so we'll hear from him later on ahead of Scotland's series in the USA that starts this weekend. But... We are going to show you now our first interview, which is with our first international player, uh, which is quite something. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I've actually got an international player that's come on to speak to us. I know. Excellent. Uh, money well spent. <laughs> <laughs> She's going to see this and think, money? Who got that? <laughs> I was that agent. So I don't know about um, so uh, we have just had a conversation with Megan McCall of Scotland's Women and she's the skipper of the Northern Lights uh, women's team um, who we spoke about on a previous episode and um, who are based out of Aberdeen. So we're going to pass over to that interview with Megan now. We are delighted to be joined by Northern Lights captain and Scotland women's all-rounder, Megan McCall. Megan, thank you very much for joining us. How are you? Yeah, I'm good, thanks. Yeah. So, um, as I mentioned there, you're Northern Lights skipper, the um, new women's side based out of Aberdeen for this season. That's the, the main reason, I suppose, that, that we wanted to speak to you. Uh, and you got off to a flying start this weekend. Um, how are you feeling post that? that first game win and a century for yourself as well? Oh, I mean, like, to have that first game finished was, uh, it, it just felt good after. I mean, like, the whole day was was pretty special in terms of it being the first game that um, kind of the north region of Scotland has, has got, like, a team from. Uh, so I think the whole day everyone was quite excited to, to be playing and, you know, just being involved in the Women's Premier League, but obviously, like, getting the win and myself and obviously Becky scoring 100 and Emma scoring 50, obviously, like, it was a good team performance all round. So, like, we're all quite excited for the next game on Sunday coming up as well. And at the Grange as well. A pretty special place to start off too. 
Yeah, definitely. Like, I mean, I've never played at the Grange before, so it was like a great pitch, obviously, and just a great day to get be played at the Grange. No, and that's excellent, I suppose, the fact that, you know, there's women's cricket getting to take part. And really, I suppose, what would be fair to say is the premier cricket ground in the country. So, And you certainly took advantage of that. I hadn't actually appreciated that it was only a 30-over innings as well when I saw it. I don't know why in my head. I thought it was 40 or 50. I couldn't remember exactly. And then I was like, so it was an impressive knock. But I was like, that must have been at some rate as well that you were flying along at. Yeah, I mean, it was definitely a, um, definitely a, a, the quickest one that I could ever imagine. Quickest 50 I think I've ever gotten before, but uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, well, you, you've set the bar high, certainly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, as I said, new club, so a lot of unknowns for, for you. How are your numbers looking at the moment? Um, what, what's going on, really? Um, yeah. So what are your numbers like, first of all, I suppose? <laughs> uh, so in terms of numbers, we've obviously got, I think we've got a squad of around 15 um, so far. Um, that's obviously from like Falkland, basically, to some people up in Huntley as well. Uh, yeah. So a mix of kind of the whole north of uh, Scotland. But I mean, we've got a decent amount of numbers. Uh, like Sunday was... First game, I mean, we only had 10, um, but it's looking good for the rest of the season in terms of having, like, a good squad to choose from. And I suppose, as you mentioned there, you've got a massive mix of clubs spread across a massive region as well. So, practically, how is it working? Are you sort of just together on a Sunday? Are you training separately as well? Uh, so... Everyone's obviously training with their clubs uh, still. And then we do um, a training session up at Aberdeenshire every like second Friday. Uh, so we all get together every second Friday and do some training. Um, and obviously then see each other on the Sundays as well. Yeah, because I mean, that would be some commitment, your club training, going weekly training for that. Yeah, I, I'm sure a lot of you probably playing on a Saturday. I know, I know you do yourself. Um, and then a Sunday, so it'd be a heck of a commitment for people. So I think we can let you... That's probably still netting more than most club cricketers do anyway, so every second week. Yeah, that's about right for me, so... <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, Andrew, there's not much point in you turn up tonight. So. Oh, very good. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, on you go. <laughs> on, on, on you go. I thought you were just running the whole thing, seeing as you've been on the interviews this week. Um, yeah, so I can't even remember what I was going to say now, <laughs> being cut off. Yeah, so is this a, a Cali region thing, I suppose? Obviously, you're saying people from Falkland and Huntley. I mean, how, who's sort of, I know it's based in Aberdeen, but how has this been run? Is it been run by Cricket Scotland? Is it been run by Aberdeen? How does it work behind the scenes on that basis? Uh, so I think it was. Carla Holmes uh, was like the sponsor and they gave Aberdeenshire um, some money to invest in women's cricket. And obviously Aberdeenshire not having a lot of women uh, involved at their club decided to um, create like a new a new club sort of like a new name, which would be the rep that which would represent um, basically, yeah, the whole of the Cali region to allow women and girls all over to come and play and represent the kind of North Cali region um, rather than having to just play men's cricket or boys cricket and or travel to Edinburgh and play for a club like I did um, last year. Uh, so that's kind of how it goes about. So yeah, Aberdeenshire are kind of like the runners behind it, um, but it is separate. It's not Aberdeenshire club. Yeah, because I noticed on the Cricket Scotland website, um, it's, it's Aberdeenshire's badge that's against your scores. I thought, oh, I don't know how that goes down. <laughs> Wait a bit of attention. Because <laughs> unsurprisingly, we have, we have a team of the week. Um, and uh, unsurprisingly, yourself and Becky have made the team of the week. But yeah, I had to take the Aberdeenshire badge for the graphic. And I was like, this isn't really correct. But um, 
as, as I mentioned earlier, I've been ill this week, so unfortunately I've not had time to hunt down the Northern Lights logo anywhere. But um, <laughs> So apologies if that offends, offends you at all. <laughs> right, so I suppose let's talk about um, the Scotland side as well. So uh, big news yesterday, um, Scotland women's were awarded ODI status. Um, which hopefully means a whole host of new opportunities. What was your reaction to that? Uh, obviously, it was it was great news to hear it. Um, we we did only find out this like the kind of same day it was released on social media, uh, so it was quite a short. Like we were all very happy with the news. Obviously, uh, I don't think anyone kind of saw it coming. Um, obviously, to be able to like. Obviously, playing T Twenty cricket is is great, um, but being able to hopefully be involved in kind of more ODI kind of World Cups and that going forward, it definitely gives us uh, the opportunity to play a lot more kind of um, capped games for Scotland rather than just like a lot of T Twenty Is um, because the ODIs didn't count at that point. So everyone's quite happy with the news. Yeah. I suppose, it, I suppose the Women's Premier League, one of the, the sort of linking back into that, I suppose if it is a shorter format, it, I don't know if there's any hopes and aspirations for them to become longer games just to kind of build that, like fill that gap between, it's not that much longer than a T20 just now. So I suppose it might be a big change for some people playing longer innings and things like that. Yeah, I think that's maybe one of the, things with the Women's Premier League is that because it targets not just like obviously this the kind of Scotland players it targets like new people into new women into cricket I think that that's kind of the thing the Cricket Scotland thought behind that is 30 overs is maybe enough for like young girls um, especially um, but hopefully in the future it can maybe get pushed up to like maybe 40, 45, 50 overs um, in the future. It must get a bit confusing for you, to be fair. Like, you'll be playing 20, 20, 30 overs. You play 45 overs on a Saturday, I'm sure. You might have the odd 50 over game in there. It must mess with your head a bit as to what you're doing. <laughs> yeah. I suppose particularly as someone who bowls as well, because the number of overs you've got is always changing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, and even batting, though, to be fair, your, your mindset, you know, come out swinging from ball one and you're like, oh, wait, I'm playing a 50 over again. Whoops. <laughs> <laughs> so I suppose on the bowling, um, so you used to bowl seam and I hear are now bowling spin. What brought about the change and how are you finding it? Uh, so in terms of how I'm finding it, it's um, it's going all right, actually. Like I've been picking up some wickets in uh, in the men's game. Uh, I'm yet to bowl in, in the women's game, but hopefully in the next few weeks I'll get to take some wickets in that. Um, but kind of came about just because... Um, so, obviously, I was getting wickets in men's cricket, um, bowling my team. Uh, but the I don't... The, the pace that I bowl is obviously, you know, it's quite difficult for men's pace because it was quite, it was quite slow. Uh, but in terms of the women's game, it's quite easy to just kind of stand there and, and whack it and I think my kind of logic behind it with kind of like you know input from Scotland coaches and maybe some other people that I you know think have a good knowledge of of like women's cricket um, and yeah. just kind of think that if I want to go into a more professional setting in the future which is kind of my my goal and um, to maybe play in England um, somewhere and um, so thinking that if I both spin, I'm going to have a greater chance of being able to perform like as an all-rounder rather than just kind of set my cricket on just my batting. Because uh, I've always wanted to be an all-rounder. That's kind of been my goal in life yeah. uh, with my cricket. So bowl and spin gives me a better chance to play at a, a higher level, you would say, than bowl in my scene because it's just not really that effective in women's cricket. Yeah, I mean, that makes complete sense. So when when did you make the decision to change over? Um, so it was a little bit of, I was away in Malaysia um, on the 
tour uh, for the Commonwealth Games qualifiers. And yeah. obviously I played in a warm-up game and then got injured. So I didn't play. And it was a lot of like, when I was out there, like the, the team's got a lot of seamers on it. Yeah, so I yeah. was already kind of getting a kind of, I was I was in the team as a batter rather than like a bowler. Um, yeah. So when I was kind of out there, it was just like, someone was like, oh, why don't you just like, why don't you just try and bowl spin? And I was just like kind of mucking about because I wasn't really playing any games because I was injured, you know, on the side, just kind of bowl and spin and whatever. And then I was like, I could actually give this a proper go and see how it goes. So kind of just came from there. And I think I think it's paying off. I mean, hopefully by the end of the summer, I'll be taking like wickets all over the place. So Yeah, so it'll be still fairly early days, but it was three wickets on Saturday, wasn't it? So it's... Yeah. That's, that's a good start. <laughs> yeah, it's all right. <laughs> yeah, against one of the fancied teams in the league as well. So, so uh, no small achievement. But no, that's, I think that's always good when you and you hear these things and it's good to see that coaches are putting that input in. And I suppose probably from our point of view, we maybe don't think about that kind of, you know, the variance between men's cricket or and boys' cricket and female cricket. I mean, I, faced yourself last season and I've you know bowling seam and I f- did find it a nightmare to try and get away but yeah so it's I suppose that's just yeah it's something as male cricketers I suppose we're maybe a bit naive to so um sure we will follow how you're going um and and see if it pays off um but you mentioned about being in the Scotland team as a, as a batter uh primarily um recently and you've got a master class coming up um on the 10th of june um yourself and lorna jack i believe um are you looking forward to that that's something a bit different in scottish cricket uh yeah i think that'll be good i think it's good that the kind of is it the edinburgh cricket kind of association that have managed to get that going i think that's a really good kind of step for to just to get the kind of new women and girls that are coming into cricket just to get maybe some tips from myself and and Lorna um just to see like how we bat as international players and I think I think it'll be good fun like I've I was um there on Wednesday um kind of at training in the the field and one was going ahead which was obviously Karis and uh, Abby that were running that and it looked like a good turnout so I hope that um Myself and and um, Lauren, I can get the same turnout, and hopefully we can just share some of the the knowledge and experience that we have with the women and girls. I noticed Twitter was saying there was only a few spaces left, so I suppose if anyone is listening or watching the podcast, I suppose get their, their name down and not to miss out from your learn from your big hitting exploits and find <laughs> out how it's all done. Yeah, so I think that's pretty much everything that that we wanted to to discuss with you so once again Megan thank you very much for joining us um really appreciate you taking the time to have a chat um and all the best for the season ahead in the colors of our both northern lights and scotland thank you yeah. thanks to Megan uh, for coming on and joining us i hope andrew wasn't too boring for you Ah, cheers, mate. <laughs> we, I mean, you know, there's not, we're off a chat of this episode, Andrew. It's not good enough. Yeah, it's lots not... of chat from me, which, yeah, it makes a difference. Anyway. I thought you were going to say good chat. I'm not that confident in myself. Oh, well, yet. you'll get there, mate. You'll get there. <laughs> Don't worry about it. We've been doing big time interviews, as we're going to see later on. But Indeed. Let's talk about some domestic cricket, yeah. shall we? Domestic chat. So... It's team of the week time, I suppose. Team of the week. That, that needs a jingle as well. Team of the week. <laughs> <laughs> Get noting all these production <laughs> things down. <laughs> Voice over <laughs> man for the episode. <laughs> and a team of the week jingle. Absolutely. Yeah. You know. Yeah, right. You need to get one of these soundboards going. Yo, you can get them on the iPad and that would work on our We're gonna do this. Mixer, We're gonna so do this. We'll do it at some point. I'm in charge of that though. You're in charge of the soundboard. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, you're the DJ, producer, director, but I'm doing the soundboard. So <laughs> it makes complete sense. Yeah. So, right. Team, team of the week. week. So I'll pass it on to the screen and then you can read through it this week since right. you're complaining about not speaking much. So here we oh. go. It's on the screen. I see it on the screen. 
No, right, okay. So, yeah, so we did drop a spoiler in the interview with Megan. So, uh, we've got Rebecca Glenn and Megan McCall of the Northern Lights opening pair. We felt, you know, monumental. They just couldn't be missed out. And they've earned a place as well. I mean, we're not yeah. just doing it. I have just to just to nice. jump in there. Graphic designer, I love what you've done with the half and half logo. Ah, oh, Ken, look at it. It's beautiful. That is superb work. It is. Even if, as you mentioned on the interview, it's an Aberdeen shirt. Well, I'm blaming Cricket Scotland for that, but anyway. And not so. A Northern Lights one. But we'll yeah. get that sorted. I've been ill, as I've mentioned a couple of times. <laughs> so, you know, I wasn't able to find the Northern Lights logo. But we'll get it sorted. Don't worry. Because I'm sure, you know, the Northern Lights are going to feature heavily on this because they're going to be <laughs> smashing the rest of Scotland to all parts. So that's what we like yep. to see. In a friendly manner, of course. Yes. Anyway, so they're our opening pair. Megan also took 3 for 14 in the defeat of Fruki uh, on Saturday for our broth. Hence the half and half. Uh, Majid Rashid is in at 3 um, with a 52 and 2 wickets against Partuka. And then a monster innings against Butte, and Butte County and Cowell. Cowell yeah. Is that, yeah. In the something, whatever it's called, Village Cup. It's yeah, the Village Cup. Venus Village Cup. I don't know. They didn't pay us to say the name, so who cares? <laughs> 165 off 76 balls. He wasn't um, for hanging about, was he? Absolutely not. Yeah. Um, and actually, his brother didn't make the team, and he got, what, like, 79 off 38 balls or something, but that speaks to the strength of this week's team. Yeah, he scored at more than two a ball. And yeah. Didn't. Uh, and for a reasonable amount of time, didn't yeah, make team I of the week. I think perhaps Butte County were maybe just a mismatch for Meagle, and that probably actually discounted him. Um, Craig Cameron of Arbroath, another Arbroath player in. A T20 performance this time. 83 off 60, defeating Meagle. Um, which I was actually a little bit surprised on that one. But um, after falling to Partuka in the previous set of yeah. games... I thought Meagle would probably have the better of them. And then uh, Tian Britz, um, who I've just realised there's a typo for, but excellent. Um, <laughs> 64, not out, and 29 balls against Duke in the T20. Um, he had, I believe, arrived on Monday. Yeah. Um, and uh, just yeah. arrived and said, hi, Duke, I'm just going to batter you. Unfortunately, the rain defeated them um, and the game wasn't actually complete uh, and then followed that with 120 off 107 balls against Aberdeenshire I did lose but um, still what a way to announce yourself um, yeah we we spoke previously that could he be the difference for Strathmore and them actually making a challenge at the, the top end of the uh, of the division and yeah he's really hit the ground running so there's a chance that Hopefully yeah. he'll, he'll propel Strathmore forward. So, Andrew, if you just take over reading out the team of the week and then I can fix my spelling mistake and then well, we'll be all Before I bring good. it back up? Uh, yeah. No, I think that one's right. So, yeah. uh, it's a bit of a spoiler, but hey All oh, right, okay, I've got you. I understand where you're going with that, okay. Uh, <laughs> um, so, yeah, uh, we'll bring it back onto screen as well. Lewis Munro of Aberdeenshire in that same game, victorious effort against Strathmore. 92 not out with the bat and 4 for 51 from his 9 overs with the ball. So, a uh, superb performance and kind of dragged them um, with the bat to... Did they chase it? Or did they set the total? They set the total. They set the total. So he dragged them to a competent total. But very much the match went with both yeah. facets in yeah. that game. Yeah. Um, Jack Henderson, someone that Callum and I know fairly well, I suppose. Yep. Um, 89 not out from 78 versus Fruki for Falkland. This was a Village Cup performance. And Falkland were in trouble at 25 for 5? Yes, all sorts of trouble. Yeah. Um, and yeah, to a bystander who we mentioned about Zed Rashid not making Team of the Week might look at this and go, well, how is he not in ahead of that? But, I mean, Jack just dragged them to victory. Yes, so. he did. So, yeah, uh, he controlled the chase and got Falkland over the line. So, superb performance from him. Um then we're into the bowlers. Uh, Prashant Wigg, who I think is making his second appearance in his team, the team yeah. of the week. He is, uh, yes. He took six for 28 from his nine overs against Kinloch for Gordonians. Uh, Luke Bain, this was a T20 performance. Four overs, four, from, four for seven. 
in a T20 I for mean, Aberdeenshire. It's expensive by my standards. But <laughs> <laughs> in a T20. That's, that is phenomenal. Superb. Uh, Nathan Coffey, I presume that's the Huntley logo. It is the Huntley uh, logo. The Huntley You're logo. London, Andrew. Proud of you, mate. Proud yeah. of you. In the same game, he took 5 for 21 for Huntley um, against Aberdeenshire. Uh, and then John Grant of Stonywood Dice with a couple of performances. So he took 3 for 16 from 4 against Gordonians in the T20. And then 5 for 44 from 10 versus Grange at the weekend. The Unfortunately, John couldn't hang about long enough to get the two runs required for victory and was last man out. Um, while his skipper Jamie King was smashing the ball, uh, so that was under. I mean, w- the, it was such a strong week. Um, it was, yeah. And you know, I slightly at points. Th- I think we have had about five versions of this team of the week this week. Yeah. Well, I mean, we have to kind of make special mention to um, I forget his first name, Chowdhury of Dundee High School. Yep. Uh, playing against four for sure took six for 36. And yeah, unfortunately it, it was too weeks. expensive was yeah. the problem. <laughs> um, yeah, and we yeah. just felt that Luke's performance uh, for Aberdeenshire, um, just the sheer tightness of it. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think our T25 for is probably better than a longer format six for. Yeah, so. um, and there was a 90-odd with the bat from Usman Saeed at Perth yeah, Ticket as well. Yeah, four not out, I believe. Um, <laughs> there was a couple of 80, um, there was a, another couple of 80s kicking about and things like that, yeah. and T20 performances and things like that. So yeah, um, absolutely, probably, if ever I thought there was a week, people might be like, why are they not in? Probably this is the week. Um, yeah. But we're trying to weigh up um, the impact on the game and and also trying to be fair to like a T20 because it, it, there's less time to score as many runs and things like that. Yeah, so, absolutely. Um, I mean, if you disagree and you think someone else should have been in the team of, week, team of the week, then do let us know on Twitter at DibDobPod or in the comments on our YouTube channel. Um, I mean, you'll be wrong, but let us know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I suppose that brings us in to the player of the week. Have you corrected the typo? Uh, the typo is now correct. Fantastic. So... We can bring up the player of the week. The player of the week that everyone will be su- so surprised. So shocked. Who it is. So um, surprised. Strathmore's Tian Britt. Um, 64 not out off 29 balls against Perth and 120 off 107 against Aberdeenshire. Decent first week for him in, in Scotland, I suppose. Absolutely. Because, I mean, he's coming from South Africa. Um, hard decks. I know, you know, played alongside like Australian and South African overseas players, and the usual, the, or well, not, but at times they'll struggle because it's such a different, yeah. You know, the ground conditions are so different. It clearly has not struggled with this yeah. at all. Um, probably, I think they played Aberdeenshire at Manifield, so. And Duke, it was at Duke? Yeah, that so, okay, so? two of the better band tracks you're probably going to get. Yeah, in this sort of in this area, but I mean, still, what a way to announce yourself! And you know, Strathmore have probably not been the most happy with their start to the season, and he kind of looks like an addition to their squad, which could really turn things round yeah. for them. Um, yeah, so um, superb week. So, where does that leave our SPCU sides in the league tables? We'll have a quick look at the Eastern Premier <sighs> League. They've even done graphics for these. Probably something wrong with them, but you know, yeah. we'll find out. Well, yeah, we'll see. I can't see anything wrong with them. So, Forfarshire fell to defeat. Um, they did against Castorfin. Indeed. So, they are knocked off of top spot, and Heriots assume the mantle of the top side in the division. And, hmm, they, they might not be deposed at all, to be fair. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, because the, the mental thing with Heriot's is you look at the guys that have lost in the Scotland squad and then you just look at who's left and you're like, wow, that's probably still a championship winning side. So, yeah, they're going to be the team to beat, but I think everybody knew that going into the into it. So, yeah, um, definitely. Stonywood Dice doing okay. It's um, and I mean, they only narrowly lost. To Grange as well. Um, yeah. I think Jamie King, I saw he did a, a, a newspaper article um, on the Sunday or Monday and, you know, he did say they really let Grange away with it 
And yeah. I mean, that's absolutely true. Probably not going to get a better opportunity against a side like Grange. But, um, and Falkland are off the mark. Yeah, good news for them. Bad news for the other SPCU yeah, area team. Because they beat Arbroath. Um, yeah, so that, that bottom three of Falkland, Stumel and Arbroath are probably likely to be the bottom three through the majority of the season. Um, so Falkland will be absolutely delighted to get that win under their belt against sort of a, a direct competitor. Yeah, it's realistically two or three wins you're probably staying up. Yeah. So, um, absolutely. And yeah, and you, you do look at it. Obviously, Team of the Week, um, Jack featured there. Um, it was for the Sunday performance rather than, than yeah, Saturday. But yeah, but it still, you know, it kind of shows that there's maybe... You know, Brock Ditchman's been playing Sundays and not Saturdays. I don't know the reason behind that. Um, and there still seems to be a big looming question mark over where the overseas player Harsha Kure is. Um, I had seen on social media they had said he was coming, but I, there's yeah. not been a follow up to that. So I don't know if if that's a you know a visa problem or, or what like. But you know, th- so there's maybe some positive signs. Some, but are both kind of looking a bit in bad shape yeah looking in a bit of trouble um so let's move on to the nec we're actually well, are both looking in trouble in the epl but they had a f- really good result in the nec for their second 11 um beating sort of one of the early favorites for the title in fruki yep um so that was a really strong result for them so Meagle are pace setters along with Aberdeenshire um, each with 100% records um, Fruki Huntley Gordonians and Arbroath 2s following them fairly closely um, you've got Stonywood Dice 2 and Dundee High propping up at the bottom end yeah who look probably like they are I mean yeah I think I could, we could see that for most of the most season, of the season yeah. really um yeah, it's. I would be backing Stonywood to make upward progress more than I would be Dundee High. Um, but yeah, it's uh, still yeah. early days. But yeah, Fruki, an interesting one. Um, obviously, Safi and Sharif is now away over to America. Um, yeah. But you then look at it and go, right, but it's then the same Fruki team that you had last year. And I mean, they've lost our both and they've lost through the week. Um on Tuesday night to Duke it as well. Yeah, in the T20s. So, I don't know. It's after their massive score, um, heads are maybe dropped a wee bit. So, it'll be interesting to see how they can bounce back. Um, yeah, and they also let Falkland off the hook massively in the Village well, Cup. At absolutely. Well. So, confidence so. probably isn't going to be the most high in the Fruki camp. Um, and as we will touch on shortly, they are going up at against Meagle um, in this weekend's fixtures. Um, so yeah, let's move on to our predictions then. So last week's predictions, I don't want to talk about it. Uh, <laughs> Absolutely wonderful, Andre. It's really good. Yeah. So we, as we said, Fruki failed to get over the line against our broth and I had them as my joker pick. So you even had first pick as well. I did. Oh, I regret that one now. And yeah, the other pick at the bottom that I was... I doubted as we recorded the podcast last week um, and I was doubting for good reason um, as Huntley won that one and Stoney would have not done much. So, yeah, so Callum gets two points more than me this week, which, as you will see, he's oh, yeah, dancing yeah. about. Oh, yeah. And he's going to dance even more when I bring up the scores graphic, which I don't want to do. Just do it. Do it. Oh, look at that. Andrew 16. Callum 19. Yeah. And the crowd goes. That's, that's why we need a, that. That's why we need a soundboard. <laughs> so, <I'm> like, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Um, three weeks into our predictions, Callum's got a three point lead. I mean, I, I, you know, I only expect that gap to open up as the season goes on. Um, and really, for, you know, probably about midway point you to be crying when we do this segment <laughs> of the show but that's okay i mean if it keeps going as it is then that that could happen that could happen viral <laughs> live man <laughs> cries on air on podcast so live live man, live man yeah. <laughs> week five predictions then um six fixtures as i've our four for sure our broth dundee high school perth took it fruki meagle can lock huntley gordonian strathmore 
Stony Wood Dice Aberdeen Shire. And I have gone for six away wins. So I'm going for Arbroath, Duke, Meagle, Huntley, Strathmore, and Aberdeenshire. Callum, you've <sighs> gone different on a couple. S- spicing it up a wee bit. Yeah, I'm going to back. F- I slightly changed it so that we'd have slight variations. But no, nah, I still back my picks. Um, yeah, so f- four for sure are both. I don't think there's a lot between the two t- teams, and I'm yeah. just given the home advantage. So yeah, I could. To be fair, I could see that going either way. Yeah, I'm obviously for. Um, yeah, are both coming off a, a good result last week. I think they'll just carry themselves well into this week. Yep. Um, and then the other variation is Kinlock Huntley. I have gone for Kinlock. Um, he only narrowly missed out on beating Strathmore. Um, at Strathmore. So. Yeah, Huntley did me over last week by winning. I'm hoping they don't do me over this week <laughs> by losing. Fair, <laughs> d- I think Huntley <laughs> did win at Strathmore. T- yeah. So, um, yeah, it, 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 it's one. It it was one that I I could have gone either way on. Um, so yeah, well, I, I like the whole six away wins thing, so I went with that. <laughs> six away wins. So, um, Joker's your turn this week. Um, my turn this week. I need to remember who I was even going to pick. Well, you should get it up on your screen because you're about to update it. I know, but I'm I'm just, the button's ready to hit. Uh, (laughs) Aberdeenshire, that's who I went. Aberdeenshire for your joker. I um, did not think I would play a joker on this fixture when, at the start of the season. Um, Do you even think if it wasn't for last weekend you'd be playing this joker? No. 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 so I, I, I'm going with Meagle as my joker because I just think they'll have far too much for Fruki. To be honest, I think Meagle have too much for pretty much everyone in the league. Um, I, I, d- I would agree with that, to be fair. Um, even with that being said, I'm not sure if I were you had to play them. But, yeah. um, well, that's, that's what I'm going with. So... Um, yeah, so yeah, I I th- I think Duke would have been my second choice if I'd had a second choice, to be honest. But yeah, uh, but I wanted to be a bit bold, so bold, go hard or go home. Yeah, and I'll probably end up just going home. So <laughs> Furuki with a ten wicket victory. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just I can't see it. I can't see it. Anyway, um, I suppose that brings us to the the close of our domestic roundup, um, and. The next thing that we've got, I mentioned at the start, we've got an interview with um, ESPN Crick Info's Peter Della Pena. Um, you love saying that, don't you? I do, yeah. You love saying that. Absolutely. Like ESPN Crick Info. Yeah. 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 One of the biggest crickest websites. So it's, it's a big fish that we've pulled in with this one. Big fish. Um, so, yeah, that that is what's coming up next. So I will pass you over to that interview with Peter now. I'm delighted to be joined by Peter Della Pena, who is the um, USA correspondent for ESPN Crick Info and host of the Stars and Stripes Cricket Podcast. Peter, thank you for joining me. How are you? I'm great, Andrew. Thank you for having me. Fantastic. Um, so um, you, as USA Cricket correspondent, I thought would be a great person to speak to ahead of Scotland's series in the US next week. Um, so we'll come on to that series in a little bit. But I want to, what I want to find out about first is the state of sort of cricket in the USA at the moment. Um, so I believe that there is a minor league structure in place and a major league structure that is due to launch next year. What can you tell me about that? Well, these are plans that have been in the works for quite a number of years now. And initially, the Major League Cricket Franchise competition was supposed to launch in 2021. That was the first target that was laid out when ACE, which stands for American Cricket Enterprises, that's the commercial partner for USA Cricket, they signed that contract in May of 2019, shortly after USA gained the through World Cricket League Division Two in Namibia. And 
for a number of reasons. You can blame COVID on part of it, but there's other logistical issues that involved Major League Cricket, which is the 16 franchise tournament that USA Cricket and Ace and want to model on CPL, IPL, the 100, Big Bash, yeah. whatever is your T20 franchise competition <laughs> preferred. Uh, that's what they want to model it on. It was pushed back to 2022, and now it's been pushed back to 2023 just because, again, you can say COVID is part of it, but uh, also a number of logistical issues that are involved. Primarily stadium building. They don't have the venues. Yeah. The only ODI facility uh, prior to these matches that are going to be played in Texas between the USA and Scotland and the UAE and Nepal and Oman over the course of the next couple weeks, that'll be the second ODI venue that's certified by the ICC in America. But the first one and the only one prior to that is in Florida and Waterhill, where you see a lot of these T20Is that have been played between India, the West Indies, New Zealand, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, and Caribbean Premier League matches that happened from 2016 to 2018. Other than that, you've got a facility in Morrisville, which was used last year for the minor league cricket championship weekend in October. And it's a wonderful facility. It's also hosted in ICC America's T20 World Cup qualifier back in 2018. And in my mind, that's the best venue for cricket in America, because not only do you have a great turf wicket, you've also got floodlights there. And also you've got a fan base. Most of these places, you don't have fans. There's yeah. no warm bodies with a pulse that are supporting cricket. <laughs> Morrisville has that. It's a proof of concept that you've got fans that are supporting cricket there. You'll get minimum 1,000 and sometimes you'll get 2,000, 3,000 fans there, whether it's USA, whether it's a franchise event or anything else. And so those are kind of the, the bigger picture obstacles beyond COVID. It's do they have the turf wickets and yeah. do they have established fan bases within the cities that are willing to come support local cricket? One of the things that gets talked about constantly with the U.S. cricket culture is you see these mythical figures tossed out, 15 million cricket fans, 20 million cricket fans, 30 million cricket fans in, in the USA. It's hard to believe because if it's 30 million cricket fans, that would mean 10% of the population is cricket fans in America. If you plucked a random group of 10 people or 100 people and you line up these 100 people, and if you could find 10 cricket fans out of a random set of 100 people in – a city street in New York or Dallas or San Francisco, I would be quite shocked. That would be quite an astounding figure to reach yeah, that type of It sounds threshold. optimistic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And the part of the problem is that they just don't support local cricket. A lot of these, these mythical fans, mm -hmm. they're cricket fans who live in America, but they're not fans of American cricket. They'll subscribe to Willow TV, which is the major source of cricket content watching platform in America. Yeah. Or they'll get it through ESPN Plus and they'll watch the IPL. They'll watch India. They'll watch the West Indies. They'll watch England. They'll watch Australia. They don't care about U.S. cricket. And that's that's the big obstacle. If it's not ingrained in the culture on the grassroots level, how are you going to get people to support the matches? And so a big litmus test is going to be these games in Texas, whether or not you can parlay that into future success through Major League Cricket if it's going to launch next year. These Texas venues okay this one in houston um is the litmus test because according to the to the figures that were put out by ace and major league cricket they claimed there's 250,000 cricket fans between houston and dallas that two and a half hour drive between the two cities okay yeah what is that what is that number based on though it's based on data that shows willow tv subscriber base according to the billing zip codes of their customers. So again, you've got 250,000 fans, allegedly, between Houston and Dallas, the two metroplexes, okay, who watch the IPL, who watch India tours, who watch West Indies tours, whatever. But I'll be shocked if there's more than 200 people that come out to any of the ODIs this week, which is really a shame because it's a, it's a holiday weekend. In the UK, you've got bank holiday weekend in the UK. Yeah, And in the U.S., it's Memorial Day holiday weekend in America. They've scheduled these matches to try and get people to come out Saturday and Sunday, back to back. USA and Scotland are playing the first two matches. And I have heard from people who well, I'm friends with in the Scottish cricket community that there will be a decent number of supporters traveling from Scotland who are trying to capitalize on the bank holiday weekend. So they don't have to miss much work. And it'll be a fantastic opportunity to come 
see cricket in America, come see cricket in Texas for the first time. But I would not be surprised if there is more Scotland fans than USA fans at these matches, Andrew. And if that's the case, that'll just tell you the uphill battle that not just USA cricket faces, but Major League Cricket and Ace in terms of trying to cultivate a supporter base and a fan base to believe in the concept of franchise cricket in America. Yeah, I mean, it, it seems from the outside looking in that obviously cricket in, the, in America is in its sort of infancy, um, but there is there are a lot of ambitious plans to really sort of go at it quite hard. I saw there was an announcement and I read your article on, on Crick Info about the um, $120 million investment that was announced last week. Um, I'm right in saying that's again, mainly to go into to facilities, isn't it? It is, which is important and necessary, but also where is that money coming from? It's coming primarily from, Indian businessmen who are now established in America. So Satya Nadella, he's born and raised in India, came to the U.S. after graduating university and rose up through the ranks of Microsoft to become Microsoft CEO. Shantanu Narayan, CEO of Adobe, the technology firm that gives everybody Photoshop and Lightroom and everything else that you can do fancy tricks with on your computer, Okay. Same, same situation, okay? These are uh, Indian American or naturalized Indian American businessmen who love cricket, grew up with cricket in India and are trying to support ACE and Major League Cricket's vision in America. But the reality is until you get it established at a grassroots level, which is something that Scotland has done, in my opinion, a lot better than most other associates because when I go to the Scotland matches that I've covered over the last decade, it's not just the England match in 2018 where you get 6,000 yeah. people. And yeah, there were a lot of England supporters there, but there were a hell of a lot of Scotland supporters and it was a majority Scotland. Yeah, I was one of them. It was a great day. <laughs> they were there, this, you know, solitaire flags and, you know, the, uh, the lion rampant flying all over the ground and, uh, One of my favorite moments that I've ever covered a sporting event was in the last five overs when it was the match was going down to the wire. It it was like this chill scene, this this goosebump raising moment where you could hear the fans started to sing the flower of Scotland, started to ring around the ground. It was like it was it was firing up the players, and then Sakhan Sharif takes the match clinching wicket of Mark Wood. But more than what happened that day with Cal McLeod scoring a century and Johnny Beresto century and the Safian Shree final wicket. The thing that sticks out in my mind about the day is with, yeah, about four or five overs to go, you could hear the flowers. I'm, I'm getting goosebumps right now, Andrew, just <laughs> talking about it. So am I. Yeah. Reminiscing about it. The flower of Scotland. And those moments, I, I can't really recall too many of them ever happening at a USA cricket match. The only thing that comes mildly close was in December when USA hosted Ireland for the two-match T20I series, was they had about, I think it was 400 people for the first match in a 5,000-seat stadium facility in Florida, which when India has come there, it's had 12,000 people. They expand the capacity for temporary purposes. 400 people, not a lot. But there were some American flags waving there. And a couple times... When Marty Kane was going wild against Mark Adair in the final over of the, of the innings when USA was betting, and when USA again was starting to close in on a victory, you could hear USA, yeah. <laughs> USA, USA. Now, it wasn't quite loud. There was, it was echoing, not in a good way, maybe, because it was bouncing <laughs> off the empty seats in most of the stadium. But it was happening, at least. And it, if, as somebody who grew up, born and raised in America, I'm covering the matches in neutral. I try not to get attached to the national team when I'm covering them. But... It was some goosebumps, like, oh, yeah. my God. I never thought in, you know, the 13 years I've been covering U.S. cricket that I would ever actually hear a USA, USA yeah. fan <laughs> going around the stadium. And it's those kind of things, the local fans getting involved, local supporters coming to galvanize the team, galvanize other fans to show up. That's something that needs to happen again to yeah. help yeah. cricket grow in the country. Yeah, I guess they're taking the the builder and they will come 
approach. Um, because I suppose if if the locals don't know about cricket, then they're not going to come. But if you have these big visible pieces of infrastructure that are dedicated to the game, um, then I, I guess it gives you the opportunity to to get into these communities uh, and to sort of really get them interested in the game locally, hopefully. Well, and, and the, the, the issue I have with Major League Cricket and a potential obstacle is how they're trying to build up their playing base and what is the ticket to success in the league. They're bringing in an awful lot of former first-class professionals and sometimes former international uh, representatives from other countries signing them to player contracts with the dual purpose of trying to build up the quality of the playing base domestically and also have these guys work as coaches in a lot of the local academies to help bridge the gap, get the local junior players who are born and brought up in the U.S. to understand some of the better technical skills and yeah. also the mental approaches. So uh, somebody who comes to mind is Corey Anderson. <clears throat> Corey Anderson, who was one of my favorite players when he was playing for New Zealand, was a key part of the squad that went to the 2015 World Cup final. He played this incredible knock in the semifinal against South Africa that most people forget about because of what Grant Elliott did in the final over to uh, Dale Stain. But yeah, Corey, Corey Anderson was a huge, huge figure on that run to the World Cup final in 2015. He's married to an American, and he racked up enough injuries in New Zealand that he lost his contract and life circumstances and a combination of injuries took him to Texas. So he's based in Texas now. He's got a major league cricket contract. He's somebody who kids are learning from. Okay. Yeah. They're, they're local kids. They're getting coached by him. Liam Plunkett is another 2019 yeah. World yeah. Cup champion with England. He's now based in Philadelphia, same situation, married to an American woman. The key to growing in American cricket is to get all these American women to marry all these former first class <laughs> cricketers and bring them over, get them on passports. That's the ticket. That's the big ticket, Andrew. <laughs> um, but anyway, yeah. So uh, the, these guys are are trying to contribute to the kids, and then you've also got to help a lot of other players who are coming in on um, professional visas that have been organized, or players from Pakistan. Uh, South Africa, India, you've got uh, several former India under-19 World Cup players, Un Mokchand, Smith Patel, Harmeet Singh out of the 2012 batch yeah. that were under-19 yeah. World Cup champions. Now, the issue, though, is that nobody will come outright and say it, but the underlying intent is they want these guys to qualify for USA on the three-year ICC residency path, okay, which means a lot of these guys will be eligible to play for USA in 2024, 2025, Corey Anderson could potentially be suiting up for USA in the 2024 T20 World Cup that they're going to co-host with the West Indies. Yeah. Now, who are you getting, though? You're not getting Corey Anderson from 2015, who was bashing sixes at will. You could snap his fingers and hit a six 100 meters. You're getting Corey Anderson, who's nine years later, injury riddled and surgically repaired and... <laughs> Five, at least five years removed from his last first class yeah. professional yeah. match in New Zealand. And so, and and as big as Corey Anderson is in the world of cricket in New Zealand and world of cricket broadly, Corey Anderson can walk into a Kroger's or a High V supermarket in Texas any time of day and get his groceries without being bothered. Nobody knows who the hell Corey Anderson is. Nobody identifies with him. The local yeah. community doesn't identify with him. You look at other sports in the U.S., or other sports in any other country, who does the community identify with? Who does who is who is the local Texas community going to support? They're going to want to support kids who progress into teenagers and adults who have come through the local community. Yeah, these are kids who have played their sports in the local high school, go to the local university. And you look at the you know the college and pro sports scene in, in America, whether it's NBA, NFL, baseball, whatever, but in particular NBA and NFL the fans grow an attachment to these players from the time they go to the university of Alabama to the time they're, they're playing high school, Texas in football, Friday night lights, yeah. that whole, you know, the whole TV show and movie concept, it's straight out of real life. You know, where they're playing these matches, these ODIs in, in Houston, in, in Parallel, Texas at this Musa stadium, 
literally a five minute drive away. Now, Musa Stadium, the capacity is capped at 2,500 for these matches. The facility can seat 5,000 if you're being generous, if you cram enough people in. But literally, over the uh, boundary rope, if you look to the east side from Musa, you can see Pearland High School Stadium, their football yeah. stadium. It, it's called the Rig. Okay. It's an oil town, oil rig town. That place seats, I think, 20,000 people for high school football, public high school. Okay. Because the community supports them. Yeah. The, you'll mean, get 20,000 people. You'll get 20,000 people to support high school football, high school football in a, in a local town in Pearland, Texas. You had an international match five minutes away, a mile and a half to the West might draw a hundred people, 200 people. Cause there are, you know, are there any local kids from Texas in the USA national team? No. In a few years, there might be, there's, there's some promising talents coming out of Texas who could be in the USA squad in a couple of years. But if push comes to shove, you know, and they're competing with spots. If a kid from Texas who's 19 years old or 20 years old is competing for the same spot in the team as Corey Anderson, 99 times out of 100 in American cricket history, when these selection battles have, have come up, the preference, all things being equal, if both players can bowl the same, bat the same, field the same, USA selectors historically have always given the deciding vote to a guy who's had international experience from another country. Until that cycle breaks and you see what Scotland does, yeah. where Scot Scotland has Kyle Kutzer, Cal McLeod, Safian Sharif, Hamza Tahir. Um, you can keep going up and down the list. Yeah. Uh, Richie, I know Richie Barrington was born in South Africa, but he's raised in Scotland. He's got a very thick Scottish accent. Um, yeah. That's the model that you need if the sport is going to latch on and you get what you see in Scotland where hundreds or thousands of people come out to a game at the Grange or any other venue for that matter. And that's going to be the key to success for the USA national team or major league cricket going forward. Unless you get local players developed and the community says, Oh, this guy went to McKinney high school in Dallas, or this guy went to Pearland high school in yeah. South Houston. And now he's playing for USA. And the community says, Oh, we want to support our local pride and joy. Uh, that's how you're going to get the, the fan base and the culture growing in the right direction in the USA. Yeah. I mean, and hopefully it'll get there as well. Um, I think that kind of, puts us into a good spot to move on to the upcoming series. So as you've mentioned, it's uh, taking place at the Musa Stadium in Pearland in Texas. Um, Conditions-wise, what, what are you expecting of that stadium? Um, are you expecting it to be... I, I don't know, we, but Callum and I, my, my co-host on the podcast, had this discussion last week. I could see either being maybe similar to Australia, South Africa, or is it more going to be sort of subcontinental conditions? I really have no idea. Neither. Neither. It's very, it, it's very tropical, is how I would describe it there. It's a very, especially at this time of year, I've covered events at Moose before. Now, Moose, to clarify, it's just gotten ODI status certification, so it's yeah. going to be hosting its first ODIs. But this is a facility that's been open for seven years, and I've covered a number of events there over the years. And at this time of year, when it gets into June, July, it is unbearably hot, Okay. And not just unbearably hot, it's unbearably humid and hot. So I remember covering an event there in 2017 or 2018. It was a ICC America's junior tournament between USA, Canada, and Bermuda. And on the first day, one of the Bermuda opening bowlers bowled a three-over spell, and at the end of his third over, he collapsed on the field. And they needed to get first aid personnel out there to get him back on his feet and just get him on a stretcher. And they were just fanning him, you know, throwing yeah. water on his face. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and then, and then the next day, same thing happened to a Canada player. He was like, he didn't fully collapse, but he was on the verge. Yeah. And they rushed out. They thought, Oh no, here we go again. And <clears throat> those were for 50 over matches. It was one dayers. Same yeah. thing. Okay. And these, these, you know, you think, fit, conditioned, 18, 19-year-olds, um, people who shouldn't be having health issues, and they were dropping like flies. It was uh, it was pretty remarkable how... how he, and I remember taking photos on the boundary at these matches, and I'd be out on the boundary 
taking photos with my long lens and, and my uh, monopod with my ca camera outside like this. And all of a sudden I could feel my foot getting very wet. Uh, what's going on? Why is my foot starting to, to get <laughs> unusually moist? And what's happening? The sweat is dripping, coming off my elbow and dripping off my elbow straight onto my foot um, wow. while I'm trying to take photos. Just just for standing out there for three, four hours, 15 minutes was all it took. And all of a sudden, um, sweat soaks yeah. through my shirt, through everything. So these matches, more than anything, are going to test the fitness and the conditioning of the players involved. And I know the stereotype for teams out of the UK, whether it's football or cricket, is that they struggle adjusting to hot conditions at times. And so I think Scotland will yeah. be a team that is yeah. targeted in that regard. Although I suppose the Scottish team have played a lot of cricket in the UAE um, and in that part of the world. So I guess they're used to playing in certainly extreme heat, maybe not the humidity that they're going to experience. Um, the humidity but, is the big difference. Yeah. 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 It's, it's when you get to that in Texas, the, you know, the difference between the dry heat and the, the humid heat. I mean, it'll be every day the forecast is 30 degrees Celsius, but with the humidity, it's going to feel like it's pushing 35, 40. Yeah. And it's just going to be hot, sticky, uncomfortable. And that's the, when I say tropical, that's what I mean. Yeah. In terms of the actual batting conditions and the, and the pitch itself, especially at the start of this series, because again, they're going to be tw playing 12 ODIs on this venue. And I think they only have three pitches. So right. either three or four pitches on the square. So they got to just stretch it out over the course of the three weeks. At the start of the series in particular, the groundsman who's at this facility used to be the groundsman in Waterhill, the ODI venue there. And he is notorious for just rolling, 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 shaving that pitch bare and just turning it into a batting paradise. There will be nothing on the wicket in terms of grass. Yeah, It's just going to be, I would expect it to be 275, 300 par scores. I would expect century score, especially early in the week, um, early in the series, as, as the matches continue over the course of the 12 matches, I would expect spinners to come to play a bit more and maybe batting will get a little bit more difficult as the pitches start to break up. But early on, Scotland, especially Scotland playing USA the first two matches, if I'm uh, Richie Barrington or if I'm Cal McLeod or Kyle Klitzer or Matthew Cross, um, when of the toss, bat first and looking to pile up as many centuries as I can over the course of, of these matches because I think – Everything I know about Samuel Plummer, who's the curator there and who has yeah. been the curator in Waterhill, he produces batting paradises. And I would expect no less than three or four centuries coming out of Scotland over the course of this week and potential for USA and UAE to score a number of centuries too. Yeah, so batter's decks then uh, is what, what we're going to expect. So the US, they've named a 14-man a squad um, for... It's for the full 12 ODIs, isn't it, that they've named the squad for. Um, I see notable returns for Rusty Theron and Cameron Stevenson, who haven't played in the last is it 18 months or so since they've they've last played for the US side. In ODIs, anyway. In ODIs, yeah. Rusty was part of the T20 World Cup qualifier squad in Antigua in November, but he has not played and neither has Cameron Stevenson since the last ODI tour in Nepal in February 2020, which was the last series just before the pandemic began. So <clears throat> I would argue Cameron Stevenson is actually the more important addition in terms of wicket-taking potential. He had a streak when he debuted for USA, going back to the series in the UAE that was the last time USA played Scotland in December 2019, and then carrying over into Nepal. I think he had something like five matches in a row where he took three wickets. He's a very, very good wicket taker. Can be a little bit expensive at times, but he has something different in terms of height, bounce, a little bit of extra pace. He's not express yeah. pace. The ball is about 85 miles an hour, 135, 140. So he's, he's not extreme, but he's quicker than the rest of the USA bowling unit. And just from his height, he's about 6'2", 6'3". Uh, he gets a little bit of extra bounce. He can hustle uh, players, and he caused some problems when Scotland and USA last faced off in the UAE. And Rusty Tehran is not somebody who 
again, at this stage of his career, he's not expressed. He's he's definitely got some some uh, physical limitations in terms of his fitness. I wouldn't expect Rusty Tehran to play every match in the series, especially yeah. the back to backs. Yeah. So the first two matches, I, I, if Rusty plays one out of the two matches against Don, I wouldn't expect him to play both. But he's clever. He's experienced. Again, not expressed. He's bowling 80, 85 miles an hour, but he is very cagey in terms of his changes of pace, slower balls, cutters. He's got every trick in the bag. And that's, again, something that has made him valuable to USA and why they've recalled him for this series. Yeah. Um, and then there's obviously going to be a, a notable sort of debutant, I guess. Um, Yasser Mohammed is in the ODI squad for the first time. Uh, 19-year-old leg spinner, what, what do you expect from him? Well, not just him, but also uh, Rahul Jarawal, another California teenager um, who's expected to make his ODI debut. He was in the squad for the Ireland series to make right. his ODI debut, and then those matches never happened. They got canceled. Yeah, I see, yeah. So he's, he's been retained in the squad, but he will most likely make his debut, Rahul Jarawal, is again a 19 year old, uh, no, sorry, I think he's seven, 17 or 18 year old. Uh, I should know this. What's wrong with me? <laughs> he's a teenager, broad sweeping term, Andrew. Teenager, <laughs> teenager from California. Yeah, he's going to be making his uh ODI debut, and he's outstanding. He was the leading scorer in the national championships, the 50 over national championships that were held in Texas in November at the Prairie View Cricket Complex. And he's in incredible form right now, Yasser Muhammad. I don't know if he'll play as many matches as I would expect Rahul Jarawal to. USA typically in the last couple of years has been quite conservative in terms of their selection methods with regards to finger spin versus leg spin. Usually they pack their teams with left arm spinners. They've got a couple of left arm spinners in the squad in Isar Patel and Astush Kenjige. But right. Yasser... I, I've been somebody who's been pushing for them to get a leg spinner constantly. They had tremendous success. Part of the reason why they got ODI status was because they had Hayden Walsh in the USA team at that time frame that put them over the top in 2018, 2019. And since Hayden Walsh left USA to go play for the West Indies, they haven't really had that wicked taking threat as a leg spinner in the same way. And I think, the fact that they picked Yasser Muhammad, who made his T20 I debut against Ireland, and I thought he bowled incredibly well for a teenager who was coming up against a test nation. He was not overawed by the occasion at all. I think it's a very positive move. I hope he plays a lot of the matches. Again, I think it would be an aggressive move, a positive move to pick a leg spinner. USA, as I said, traditionally has been quite conservative in that regard. So they prefer economical bowlers that are dependable rather than taking that risk yeah. for a leg spinner um, who can obviously be expensive at times, but brings a lot more wicket taking potential. I hope he plays most of the matches that's yet to be seen. But one of the other things he brings to the table is he's an outstanding fielder and USA. One of the things they do is, is they like to find guys who check all the boxes and coming up through the junior cricket scene in New Jersey, he's actually been more of a batsman. He's a very dynamic middle order player, at least to the junior cricket team, who he's not afraid to reverse sweep from ball one. I was talking right. to him earlier. <laughs> I, I was talking to him earlier, asking about, you know, have you watched any any videos of George Muncie? Do you get any tips from watching George Muncie on the reverse sweep? And, you know, who's your reverse <laughs> sweeping idol and all that? And uh, he, he loves just being creative at the crease. And he's an exciting player to watch from that standpoint. But... USA hasn't had a leg spinner really since Hayden Wallace Jr. They had Tamil Patel, who was there for a long time, but um, he bowled a very different style of leg spin to Hayden Walsh. And Yasser Muhammad, I think, is, is that kind of similar style to Hayden Walsh, where he is a bit quicker through the air and um, just has that dynamic ability in terms of not just his wicket-taking potential, but he's an outstanding fielder. A lot of the players that are coming up through the USA junior scene right now, who are pushing for spots in the USA senior 11. Yeah. Their yeah. ticket into the team has been fielding. And Yasser Muhammad is one of those who's an outstanding fielder. So he's, if he doesn't make an impact with the ball, he's got just as much potential to make an impact with his fielding prowess and his batting if he gets the opportunity. Yeah. I mean, that's 
often one of the things you see is the difference actually between Scotland and a lot of the other associate nations. The Scotland side are very good in the field compared to a lot of the other associate sides. So um, having players that are very capable, it definitely makes a difference and it can save you a good number of runs um, over the course of a 50 over innings. Well, not just that. And one of the other things is Scotland's ability to play spin. They counter that traditional stereotype and was cultivated over a number of years of teams from Europe, in particular teams from the UK, whether it was Ireland, England, also, yeah. um, Scotland not being able to play spin. And you look at the likes of, again, George Muncy, reverse sweeping demon, not afraid to go from ball one over backward point, third man to yeah. get fours and sixes. And Richie Butt, just as, you know, Cal McLeod, the way he decimated the uh, Afghanistan Spin attack with the qualifier in Zimbabwe. Uh, Richie Barrington, no less capable against spin. Kyle Kutzer, you've got a top and middle order that you put them in spinning conditions against a spin heavy attack, and they're not intimidated by any stretch of the imagination. And that's another thing. As the decks start to wear, maybe in the middle of the week when they come up against the UAE in their second two ODIs. I think Scotland is very well situated in terms of their team balance and how they approach things historically that they could have a very successful week in Texas. Yeah. So just to round up then, um, what are you expecting of the week? So, so focusing on the first series with the USA playing Scotland and the UAE, how are you expecting them to, to come out of that? Well, if you look at their record historically, USA actually has a winning record against Scotland in international cricket. I'm not <laughs> sure if people are aware of this, but I was there all four matches, the official matches anyway, 2010 T20 World Cup qualifier, 2012 Scotland lost to USA on both occasions. And then in the UAE in 2019, they split the two ODIs. So all internationals, USA has got a three and one record against Scotland. But I think Scotland, you look at the form, USA struggled quite a bit. Yeah. In the overall context of Cricket World Cup League Two, I think at best USA can can look at splitting the two matches against Scotland. I think Scotland will at least win one, if not both. And then it's a case of coming up against a UAE team, if you're Scotland, who has been in outstanding form. They won the their half of the T20 World Cup qualifier in Oman. They beat Ireland twice out there and and really dominated them yeah uh, or beat, beat them three times i think in fact if you look combine between the uh, quad series that happened beforehand and they've got again just layering onto the earlier parts of our conversation young talent coming up Britia aravind who is one of the most exciting up-and-coming young batsmen in the associate world is the wicket keeper he's in incredible form he scored a mountain of runs, was named the player of the tournament at the T20 World Cup qualifier. And he's also scored, I believe, at least one or two ODI centuries in Cricket World Cup League Two uh, in the last six months or so. So you add him into the mix with UAE and the rest of their players they've got who <clears throat> have just been outstanding up and down the order. Uh, they've got uh, just a very, very well-balanced team. And again, a team yeah. that's suited to conditions. They've got good death bowlers, good Yorker bowlers, but also very good spinners and top to bottom. You know, this is not the same UAE team that started Cricket World Cup League 2 that was coming out of a match-fixing scandal where their roster was decimated. You look at any, any of the teams, COVID and the delay for the pandemic that really wiped out a year of international cricket, that arguably benefited the UAE more than anybody because it allowed their younger players a year to develop and grow and they've seized on that extra time to develop their players and now in the last six months or so that they've gotten back into international cricket those players are starting to dominate on the international scene yeah well i mean that's been a fantastic conversation peter i am conscious that the time on our meeting is running down very quickly <laughs> because I'm too tight to pay for a pro membership to Zoom. <laughs> um, Andrew, you know, you said, you, before we started, you said 15 minutes. I thought, oh, geez, Andrew, it, it <laughs> takes me 15 minutes just to say my name and say hello. <laughs> I don't know if we're going to keep this to 15 minutes. <laughs> no, it's going to be a bumper episode this week. So people are going to hear you on commentary during this um, this upcoming series next week on Willow TV in the States and on ICC TV over here. Um, so, yeah, we'll look, we'll look forward to, to hearing you on that. and. Um, 
thank you again for joining me. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you to ESPN Crick Info's Peter Della Pena there. I thought I'd name drop it in that time. Well done. <laughs> so, yeah, some interesting things to be said about American cricket. Um, yeah. Good to get some insight um, from someone who is in the know. Yeah, and someone who's been at the stadium. The games will be played out over the next week as well. Yeah. Um, sounds like going to be some tricky conditions for a bunch of pasty Scotsmen to play in. Yeah, I mean, I, <laughs> I'm sweaty playing cricket in Highland Persia, so, I mean, Christ knows how I'd <laughs> cope with that. But, you know, yeah, it um, sounds like he's back in Scotland for a lot of runs, though. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Well, hopefully, I saw in the warm-up game, Matty Cross got some runs, Callum McLeod got some runs. They're two guys that haven't had yeah. the greatest last 18 months or so, so hopefully they can carry it into into the series as well. Michael Lees has a good start with the ball as well, it looks like. Um, and a 50 with the bat too. Yep. So, so. Yeah. Michael Lees fan club over here. So. Yeah. Um, Going to have to get him on at some point. Well, we've got to, you know, you have interviewed him before, Andrew, so I'm not chop, saying chop any pressure saying. on you, <laughs> but, you know, live on air. <laughs> oh, well, it's not live. I'll edit that out. Thank you. <laughs> recorded on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, no, but interesting to hear what's going on. Um, and yeah, so I think we've had a pretty packed week. Indeed, week. it's been a busy, busy old episode. Um, I hope that you have all enjoyed it. Um, do let us know your thoughts on the Twitter at DibDobPod. Pardon me. In the uh, the comments on YouTube, Getting remember to appear by the hour, Andrew. Remember to like, share, subscribe, share it on your social media accounts. All of them get it everywhere. Um, tell your friends your family, the strangers in the street, get on the Devly Doblers. I would absolutely <laughs> love that. If there's someone that just runs up to someone, you should watch this, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> the Devly Doblers Cricket Podcast, that is what you need in your life. But who doesn't? Exactly. So make sure you keep us in your life. Um, Our wives. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we'll speak to you again next week when our wives aren't speaking to us. <laughs> Nothing new there. Bye, everyone. <laughs>